Hey, plumber boy, mustache man, your worst nightmare has arrived. Most know this as one of the biggest rivalries in gaming, Nintendo vs Sony. Two of the biggest three console manufacturers with incredible success in the video game industry. With at times Sony taking the lead in the market share, and Nintendo at other times. But this wasn't always going to be the case. At one point, Nintendo and Sony had formally agreed on creating gaming hardware together, including the SNES CD add-on and a hybrid console known as the Nintendo PlayStation. So what happened to cause the cancellation of this console and its fruitful partnership into becoming two bitter rivals? Today we'll be looking at the history of the Nintendo PlayStation. If you enjoyed this video, please hit the subscribe button and hit the notification bell too to further support us and keep creating new videos. Our story begins in the mid 1970s. Technology was in the up and up and video games were in their humble beginnings. Over in Japan, a man by the name of Ken Kutaragi had a strong passion for the rapid advancements of electronics and technology. The obvious choice? Join Sony in their digital research labs directly after graduation. And his talents built him a strong reputation for his work on several successful projects including early LCD displays and digital cameras. By the 1980s, the video game industry had hit big, going from Atari and eventually to Nintendo and dominating the market. As such, the Nintendo Entertainment System, known as the Famicom in Japan, had taken the market by storm. Many Japanese households had one, with kids absorbed by its technical marvels, and this included the very daughter of Ken Kutaragi. One day, Kutaragi took notice of his daughter playing the Famicom. That same drive for technology and electronics kicked in upon observation and made him realize the potential that video games held. The third generation of gaming was coming to a close by the late 1980s, and Nintendo was in the midst of making a successor to their juggernaut, the Famicom. Ken Kutaragi, who had a reputation for his technical prowess, was approached by Nintendo to make them a sound chip for their next generation platform, the Super Famicom, or Super Nintendo in the West. Sony was a company well known for its electronics including its TVs, all the way to its Walkman. However, they held very little interest in the video game industry. And so, with his newfound interest in gaming, Kutaragi took up this offer. In secret! Knowing this proposal would otherwise be outright rejected. Working in secret, Kutaragi designed the technical marvel that was the SBC 700, a powerful sound chip that would finally take video games beyond the typical sounds of chiptunes and to actually sounding somewhat close to real instruments. In comparison to the Super Nintendo's competitor, the Sega Genesis, the Sony SPC 700 had 64 kilobytes of RAM, supported 8 voices, and had 32 kilohertz of sampling rate. While this Genesis only had 8 kilobytes of RAM, supported only 6 voices, and had a 22 kilohertz sampling rate. While the Genesis still was able to produce decent quality audio beyond simple chip tunes, it was still a far cry from the SNES's capabilities. The same console that produced beautiful soundtracks from games including A Link to the Past, Super Castlevania 4, and Final Fantasy 6. While this chip was an amazing wonder to Nintendo, Sony however, wasn't impressed. Once the news sprang to Sony executives about Ken Kutaragi's secret deal with Nintendo, they were furious, nearly leading to Kutaragi being fired from Sony. However, his job survived thanks to the intervention of Norio Oga. Norio Oga was Kutaragi's old boss who led all of Sony's engineers before being promoted to becoming the president in 1982 and then CEO in 1989. Being president, Oga claimed he had approved the project all along, and so with one fell swoop, Kutaragi was allowed to complete his chip, and the first real ties between Sony and Nintendo were established. And while a collaboration was being made between Nintendo and Sony, here's my collaboration with HelloFresh, today's sponsor. With how busy my editing schedule is, I hardly have time to prepare food, despite having planned to sit down and eat dinner properly for a change. And so I've now turned to HelloFresh's lineup of quick and easy meals, coming with 20 minute recipes that I can fit in. All you gotta do is simply select the recipe you want, hit a delivery date, and HelloFresh handles the meal planning and shopping. So all that is done in the end is opening the box, filled with all the pre-portioned ingredients you need to start cooking. 
let alone HelloFresh is now offering one free dessert per box, and with my affinity to sugar to follow up, you bet that convinced me. And so with how much time I've been saving, videos have been coming out more in schedule nowadays, so make sure to check out HelloFresh by going to HelloFresh.com and using this code right here, or the link in the description to receive 16 free meals and free dessert while subscription is active. But now getting back to gaming's favorite new collaboration... At this point, the SNES was well into development as the successor to the NES. However, Nintendo had additional plans for the console. The Famicom in Japan had an add-on known as the Famicom Disk System, which used proprietary floppy disks and enabled a number of features for games, and Nintendo had plans to make a similar accessory for the SNES utilizing CDs for massively expanded storage. With their favorite Wonder Boy Kent Kutaragi being the bridge to Sony, Nintendo was interested in Sony developing this new piece of hardware. However, back at Sony, hostile eyes were on any gaming project going around, but President Oga, however, approved of Kudarag's ambitions to continue working with Nintendo. And so in 1988, a deal was struck between Nintendo and Sony to produce two pieces of hardware. The first would be titled the SNES CD, which was an add-on to the Super Nintendo. The second one, however, was a hybrid console of the SNES and the CD accessory called the PlayStation. And yes, there is a space between the name. The proposal for this all-in-one console wasn't so strange as Nintendo already had done that with Sharp, who made the twin Famicom that accepted both Famicom games and Famicom Disk System games. However, it was to have additional properties too, including the ability to play music and movie CDs as a second application as pushed by Sony. However, the deal that Nintendo signed wasn't one that the longtime president of Nintendo Hiroshi Yamauchi appreciated. Hiroshi Yamauchi, who was third in line to run his family business of Nintendo, had up to that point ran it with an iron fist, turning a business of making playing cards and toys into making video games when the time was ripe, thus blowing up the company into massive proportions. However, by ruling with an iron fist, he had strict regulations too, especially for third-party developers. They could only make 5 games a year and had to pay up a licensing fee just to make games for Nintendo consoles in order to get that supposed seal of approval. Even if the game was straight up shovelware, despite how marketing presented the seal. Anything else was deemed illegal and stores were not allowed to sell them. However, being more or less a monopoly at 90% of the gaming market during the NES era, third parties had to deal with Yamauchi's draconian ways as they had no other choice. And so Yamauchi has set his sights on working around Sony's contract for the add-on and the PlayStation. The deal would have enabled Sony to have complete control over these pieces of hardware, including any and every software license made for it. To Yamauchi, this was a catastrophe in the waiting. Third-party developers who were already tired of dealing with Nintendo could instead deal with Sony directly and make games for the SNES CD, thus skirting around Yamauchi's policies. It could even enable Sony to one day go independent and take these developers with them to a new console. Top that off with how Sony was positioning itself to bring in all its subsidiaries to develop games as well as filmmakers such as Steven Spielberg's new movie, Peter Pan, could be a game for this new Nintendo PlayStation. And so, Yamauchi feeling very threatened, he sent both the president of Nintendo of America and son-in-law, Minoru Arakawa, and Chairman Howard Lincoln on a secret trip to the Netherlands to meet with Sony's biggest competitor in the electronic world, Philips, on making a CD-related deal with them instead. At the time in 1991, Philips had also released their own multimedia machine that could play CD-based games too, known as the Philips CDI. This was a perfect opportunity in the eyes of Yamauchi. As David Sheff's book titled Game Over puts it best, the deal was meant to do two things at once, give Nintendo back its stranglehold on software, and gracefully f Sony, in likely the most Yamauchi manner possible. And so, with the SNES in the market and the SNES CD and PlayStation still at work by Ken Kutaragi and his team, Sony stayed oblivious to what was stirring in the background. And so, the Consumer Electronics Show, or CES, came around in June 1991 in Las Vegas, CES, as it is now, was still a place for any electronic manufacturer to show off their products, including gaming manufacturers too. Both Sony and Nintendo were set to attend this very event to make presentations. On the first day, Sony presented their ideas for the Nintendo PlayStation and SNES CD. 
basically showcasing the strong ties to Nintendo simultaneously, presenting what it is and its capabilities as the first hybrid console. At least in the West, that is. However, the gaming world was about to be in for a massive shock. The following day, Nintendo themselves were up to present, with Chairman Howard Lincoln taking center stage. And they sure did present a new partnership with Sony's rival Philips to make games for their CDI console, while abruptly abandoning the Nintendo PlayStation and SNES CD. This sent strong ripples throughout the gaming world, especially in Japan. In Japan, their bubble economy had just come to a close and now had hit a recession. Thus to many Japanese, this was seen as an absolute betrayal by making a deal with a foreign company over a local one. Basically, Nintendo had broken this unwritten Japanese law. Third-party developers were also equally furious, as they had games already planned or even developed on the CD add-on, all of which had to be downsized to fit the SNES cart now. Sony, above any other company, was furious, and was set to take legal action on Nintendo for breaching their contract. Sony, however, did try to settle their differences with Nintendo and continue this project. Eventually, they came to a deal in 1992 to continue making the SNES CD add-on while Nintendo retained software control. Thus, Nintendo got off without a penalty. The one who was truly crushed from the surprise was Ken Kutaragi. He was no executive. He was a developer who had the dream to create this PlayStation console of his, but it was all shot down over contractual disagreements. His project was killed in a very public and humiliating manner. Meanwhile, the Philips CDI deal was well underway, but all that sprang from it was a number of third-party developed Mario and Zelda games, all of which were severely panned for how bad they played and looked, to the point where Nintendo refuses to acknowledge their existence to this date. Basically, the deal was a failure on a console that was too expensive and not many owned in the first place. The rift truly never healed with their cancelled Nintendo PlayStation, and the SNES CD was quietly cancelled too by 1993, when Ken Kutaragi soon decided that they needed a major shakeup. Yamauchi in many ways had gotten what he wanted by squeezing out of the deal with Sony. Kutaragi, however, was not in a good place at Sony. The same executives who had fiercely opposed working with the gaming industry were deemed to be in the right after this, and wanted Kutaragi gone. However, once again, now CEO Norio Oga stopped this. Defending Kuragi and his ambitions, Oga had different plans and wanted Nintendo punished for his betrayal. The first approach was to now pen a deal with Nintendo's biggest competitor, Sega, by the end of 1992, a move that can be seen as Sony getting back at Nintendo for doing the same. This deal involved taking the same basic idea of the PlayStation and doing it with Sega, as Sega was also interested in a CD add-on for their Genesis 2. However, Sega president Hayao Nakayama rejected the proposal, citing that Sony doesn't even know how to make hardware or software. While rejected by Sega, the deal to continue the SNES CD was reached eventually, but realistically, the deal saw them not benefiting at all as Nintendo would take all profit. However, they still had access to their big all-in-one console, the PlayStation as something to look back to. While both Nintendo and Sega had failed them, Ken Kutragi decided to ditch working on this SNES CD altogether, and by 1993, make a new gaming console with the same brand name, the PlayStation. Now one word. No hybrid this time, just a powerful 3D graphical machine that played CDs. And so, by being rejected and betrayed by the two gaming giants, Sony was about to pay them back tenfold with their new console. In 1994, Sony started to formulate a plan to avoid becoming like previous dead consoles, like Atari and 3DO, which was to collect as many third-party developers as possible. Being that third-party developers were not happy with Nintendo President Yamauchi's actions, many of them signed on for the new Sony PlayStation very quickly, rounding up a whopping 250 developers in Japan alone. They especially focused on some major heavy hitters too, including Namco and Konami, who had the edge in the arcade market. Namco naturally prepared their racing game Ridge Racer as a launch title, and other heavy hitters followed, including Tekken, to this new console, while Konami brought everything from Castlevania, Contra, and Metal Gear over too. Their alternative competition, Sega, was seemingly worried as they had originally wished to release their next console, the Sega Saturn, as another 2D console, but quickly switched to a 3D console in order to compete. And so, the Sony PlayStation released in late 1994 in Japan, but still awaited an American release. 
E3 rolled around in 1995, where presentations were held by the Big Three. Sega made the shocking announcement of their Sega Saturn being a high price of $399. Launching on the exact day of the announcement. This threw a lot of people off. No one was prepared for the sudden launch, including third-party developers. Sony, however, being as clever as they are, came on stage right after and said, $299. Nintendo, being Sony's biggest new rival, showed off their new console, the Ultra 64, later called the Nintendo 64, in a near final state, but no games shown yet. Instead, they focused on SNES games, including Donkey Kong Country 2 and Earthbound. However, the big issue that came up was that Nintendo was still sticking strictly to cartridges over using CDs like their two competitors. With the restricted size of the Nintendo 64 cartridge, and the previously draconian actions of Yamauchi on third-party developers, this was the final straw for many third-party developers. Squaresoft, who shared a very close tie to Nintendo up to that point, had decided to jump ship and make use of the PlayStation 700 megabyte discs for their large RPGs. Many games were now going to use full-blown FMV cutscenes, voice acting, and overall larger data sizes for their games, and Nintendo 64 wouldn't allow for any of this. Thus, the prominent games that were mostly exclusive to Nintendo during the era, including Final Fantasy and a whole slew of RPGs and other genres too, were not exclusive anymore to them, but now exclusive to the PlayStation. And so, the PlayStation finally launched in September of 1995 in the West, launching with several third-party games and continuing to steadily get third-party games over time too. With Nintendo releasing their console a year later, they were already a year behind in both sales and software. With that one action of betraying Sony, Nintendo may have created one of its biggest competitors to date. Having been crushed by the very brand that they turned their backs on, and also virtually losing all their third-party support to Sony. Sony had absolutely dominated the market in just a few short years. The success of the Sony PlayStation had effectively made Ken Kutaragi, a developer who was a rather controversial figure at Sony, a revered figure, thanks to the fact that he made one of the most successful products and jumps to date. Even becoming the CEO of Sony Computer Entertainment America in 1997. While it is unknown if Sony truly would have gone this far had the Nintendo PlayStation came to fruition, it may have been inevitable that they would have entered anyways due to one man's ambition, and a CEO that supported it to the very end. Either way, is that one deal led to a brand that became even more successful with its sequel, the PlayStation 2, and still holding strong today. Meanwhile, Nintendo faltered to second place with the Nintendo 64 by a long shot. Starting with the GameCube, third-party relations started to be repaired once more, not fully, but was getting there, and eventually built themselves back up to a strong status and now can hold their own against Sony, if not outright defeat them at times too. And so that one major concept led to one of the biggest rivalries in gaming, and it leads still to date with the Switch and the PS5.